The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Aloha, buddy. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for joining us on this Yeah, podcast. great to hear that you guys are having a wonderful time in Mexico. Yes. It was really, really, Dude, really we nice. love it. We it wish was... we would have seen you there. Man. Yeah. Yeah, I really wish I could have made it. It was just... Uh... Well, next time, though. Next time, yeah. You know, we'll, we'll probably see you, go there. We, we might run down there before the conference one I more time. I can see that happening. Just yeah. to, like, make sure everything's sorted out. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Right on. Well, uh, maybe I'll head over to um, Anarchapolco as well in February and, and do a little bit of advertising for uh, Monerotopia. That will be a good place to pick up a lot of people that are yes. probably still going to be around Mexico. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Actually, can. I think I saw Raphael in here. Yeah, Raphael's in the chat. We'll, we'll talk about that later. We're thinking of going down there, too. We're thinking yeah. of that cool. going down there too. So yeah, mo- moneda means coin in Spanish, right? Yeah. So when you say crypto, <laughs> yeah. I keep saying Monero. That's I'm, I'm a, well, I've I'm made a, that same I'm mistake too. I'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, this coin Monero is really cool, and they be like, ah, see moneda, moneda, tengo moneda. <laughs> yeah, Monero. Like, oh, that's awesome. No, no, <laughs> we're just saying, yeah, I have some money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really lack like lingual skills that's hilarious like, definitely it's like i can have a full-blown conversation <laughs> about him and he'd have no idea and just smile he'd be like oh yes <laughs> <laughs> i didn't do that at all uh, i just want to say so yeah we're doing the price report for those that want to see it you can go on youtube or twitch you can see it yeah. visually well two um, locations right now yeah youtube live right now and twitch so. yeah so if you're on the spaces if you not can you can see it, it after i'm sure it'll be good in audio as well all righty. Take, so, Take it away, my friend. Hopefully everybody knows this chart. This is, uh, you know, the chart that we all love so much. I always like to start from the big picture view, right? So this is, of course, Monero US dollar. Again, we're still kind of below the uh, our, our main rising triangle here. We'll probably get back above that at some point. But let's go ahead and slip to the, uh, to the local view. And, you know, so, okay, we had our crash with everybody else. It was less bad than everyone else. I'm going to add all the, uh, the moving averages bands. Hopefully y'all can see that. I don't know if y'all can see that or not, but um, anyways, so basically price is kind of um, trending between all of the moving average bands, right? So we've kind of got these lower bands here. We've got the upper bands and it looks to me like price is probably going to be constrained between these bands for some period of time. Um, I'm still kind of thinking that if crypto takes some more big dips, it's likely that Monero is going to dip with it. You know, maybe we'll come back down here and test this band some more. Perhaps we could wick down into uh, into that circle there. But um, again, overall, we're, I mean, if you haven't sold your your stack at this point, it's really too late to do it. Whether it's Bitcoin, the, the only coin that you would, you know, the only coins you would really want to sell are the ones that are, you know, on the ropes here, right? Like Solana and FTT and probably ADA and some of those other ones. Now, the ratio is what, you know, everyone's probably looking at the ratio and it's it's wonderful. Now, there's something that I do want to point out and that is the nature of how we broke out through this descending triangle. So you can see that, you know, we had this very long sort of uh, downsloping resistance. And you can see that it took us like two months to basically to break through that. Now, normally when you break through something like this, it, it basically just goes up. But, you know, we've got some negative pressures out there from people that don't want to see Monero's price break out. Uh, but even so, um, we ultimately did break out of that. And this structure was uh, very clearly a bullish structure and it continues to be a bullish structure. So the reason that I point out all of the um, all the troubles that we had here breaking through that resistance is because we're encountering something very similar right here. So, you know, we, we did make a nice break uh, this past week, punching up through that resistance. But there might be some overhead resistance coming in soon. Right. Um, getting into the zero point, uh, sorry, point zero eight five uh, area. And there's another corroborating thing we can look to see that and that would be the Monero dominance. So again, this is a, this is a monthly view. So it's a very long term view. We'll zoom in now. And uh, essentially, you, you know, at, at this point, it looks like we're going to make it into into this downsloping line right here. And I would imagine that this ends up being some kind of resistance, maybe take a pullback. It might take us some time here, but I imagine that eventually uh, we will break through that as well. We can also go to I have a Monero oh, Ethereum chart. Here we go. OK, so we got the Monero Ethereum chart as well. So again, just for for people that uh, that might not know, this is kind of this is the lifetime standard um, deviation. You know, sometimes TradingView doesn't give me the full picture. It doesn't give me the full, like this is only going back to 2016. 
But okay, at any rate, we are sitting in between some lower standard deviation bands. Uh, XMR Ethereum does look like it probably wants to continue being bullish. Perhaps, uh, perhaps this could take just a little bit longer than we might prefer. Right, so we kind of uh, we've been bouncing, 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 and this is a rising triangle right here. I imagine uh, that we can probably break above this. Monero. So a lot of cryptocurrency has these really negative influences happening right now because you've got all these like crypto shadow banks and exchanges and all this kind of shady stuff. All of these people really help to pump the price. Um, their interests are best served with high prices, right? They want to sell box protocols or even Bitcoin and Ethereum at the highest possible price. But with Monero, they spent the entire bull market selling Monero that they didn't have, which absorbed organic buying pressure and kind of prevented price from going higher. So while they were pumping everything else, they were suppressing Monero, but they they ran out of Monero. That game can only continue for so long until they run out of um, real Monero to, to sort of cover for their, their paper Monero. So the point being that we have some a bit of a different market dynamic in the sense that we, in the past six months, it became very clear that the exchanges are riding on zero. Meanwhile, the rest of cryptocurrencies kind of leverage unwinding. So we have some of the negative effects uh, from all of that. You know, there's a lot of people that are traders and they hold Monero and they'll dump their Monero um, whenever price crashes, which is why we crashed with everyone else. But we do bounce back more quickly because, again, the exchanges just don't have any Monero. So to that point, let's go ahead and look at the... Um, this is the divergence. It's just in a straight percent. So you can see these are very narrow divergences. 0.14, you know, minus one quarter of a percent plus one quarter of a percent. And you can see that we're pretty well centered around zero. So the point on this chart is to understand that lately the price divergences haven't really been extreme. Uh, we saw Bitfinex jump up here to about a percent uh, higher than Kraken. Oh, and sorry, uh, this is all relative to Kraken. And the reason that we go relative to Kraken is because they've never shut their withdrawals for longer than like an hour, 30 minutes. We've just, it just seems like they probably have at least most of the XMR they say they do. And the other thing too is that they don't follow, like their price will stay higher. Meanwhile, Binance, Bitfinex, Qcoin, Poloniex, all the other guys' prices will just jump downwards together. And the crazy part about it is that um, like when Binance shuts down withdrawals for say three, four, five days at a time, even a week at a time, you'll see the Bitfinex price, you'll see Qcoin and these other exchanges, their prices will diverge down from, from Kraken. And you're thinking, well, you know, allegedly their withdrawals are still open. So how is it that their prices are diverging down like that? So it's it's not like, this isn't just a happenstance thing. This is a premeditated thing. Um, but okay, but anyways, so we're looking at these price divergences and, and really this is what we wanna see. You should be centered around zero. Let's make the volume adjustment so that we can understand what kind of differences, and you can see that this makes a big difference. So recently you can see that Binance diverged their price downwards significantly, but um, that was after they had already sort of diverged their price upwards. So, and you know, these aren't really huge volumes either. So this isn't, you know, this is, this is really nothing to, uh, to write home about. This right here, um, as we talked about last week, this was when crypto crashed in general. And whenever they bring the entire cryptocurrency market down, they just like to hit Monero harder, right? That's just one thing that they do. Uh, it's just a reality of, of playing in these markets. So that's what the uh, price divergences look like. Nothing really too um, too insane or nothing that's that's too negative. We can take a look at the uh, the longs and the shorts. Uh, you can see that we're still net short, right? So the white line here, the the flat white line, that's the zero point. Uh, so you can see that yeah, we're still a little bit net short, but it's nothing huge. Um, it's just kind of just lingering, hanging on. Uh, so that's what Monero looks like at the moment. I would like to show you guys the broader markets today because there's there's an interesting development happening in the stock market, and um, it's actually a very positive sign. So um, you can see on the right here is the legend. So all of these colors represent a different major asset class. So when it says crypto, we're talking about the market cap of all crypto. I'm talking about the market cap of gold, silver, and even like the aggregated market cap of all stocks and all bonds. Um, like the Wilshire 500 is um, what that index is called. And then Dixie is the dollar index. So all this is, is we just we can get a feel for how assets are performing relative to each other. Um, I divide by their standard deviation over some um, time frame backwards. And so it just gives you it gives you an idea. You can stack all these next to each other and see which assets are performing relatively better. Um, so essentially, you can see that silver has taken a nice pop, a little bit of a pullback here. Gold, same thing. We're able to see right where crypto uh, basically dumped. And we're just kind of sitting here writing. 
And I think everyone's sort of holding their breath. No one really knows necessarily what the next move is on crypto. Um, I personally don't have a huge opinion on where it goes next, but I still do think that um, there's further down to go. We're, we're getting close to those targets, but we're still not quite there. And I see the presence of black swans on the horizon for cryptocurrency still, right? You've got the, the Gox coin is going to be released at some point next year. That's actually happening. There's movement um, happening there. People are registering their Kraken accounts. And there's a few different exchanges, but everyone's going with Kraken. It's kind of funny. It seems like the word is getting out in general in crypto that Kraken is probably the most solvent uh, exchange out there. Now, that's this bull- is also bullish, amazing bullish for America. Monero, right? I'd say, right? As, as oh, yeah. Correct. Yeah, it's very bullish for Monero because, um, you know, Kraken offers uh, XMR USD pairs and, uh, you know, it's it, they have all the Monero they say they do. So this should... I think this should definitely be, it, it can't hurt, right? <laughs> having having those deposits be made to people on Kraken can't hurt. Um, and a little bit of background on that. So the Gox trustee is not a cryptocurrency expert, right? They um, they don't want to be the one setting up some new system to distribute a bunch of Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash to um, to all the victims. They're just going to make, they're just going to dump that uh, all that coin into Kraken and then Kraken can make those distributions, right? Uh, which is smart. That's really the, the right way to do it. And then there's going to be two distributions. The first one happening almost certainly next year is called the early lump sum payment. And then there's going to be a secondary distribution sometime years later where there's still other coin cases pending and other people that might have a claim on some of those Gox coin. We'll have to see how that plays out. But, you know, this is like the gift that keeps on giving. And um, FTX is the new Gox. In fact, it's bigger than Gox, um, both in terms of magnitude, like the financial magnitude and complexity. Um, so this is going to be a saga that continues playing out for for years, maybe even the next decade. In fact, this is kind of one thing that Bitcoin has big problems for it on the horizon. The United States government has like over 200, maybe 300,000 Bitcoin. They they apparently keep seizing it faster than they can get rid of it. Um, so they've got the coin they got from the Bitfinex hack, um, which I believe was like 100,000 or maybe 120,000 Bitcoin. They just seized 50,000 Bitcoin from the Silk Road, in addition to like another 70,000 Bitcoin they seized from the Silk Road. So, um, the you know, that's not good for price. That's not good for traders out there thinking, oh, man, there's hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin out there that are going to get dumped on the market. Um, so I think that's going to be a significant influence for the Bitcoin price going forward. But hey, you know, that's good for us. Um, that's that's good for Monero uh, in a lot of ways. And it's good for some of the other coins as well. So let's take a little bit shorter look on, on what's happening. So what happened this week, um, particularly with prices. So gold actually took a bit of a pullback this week. Um, while the Dixie is starting to rebound, crypto is relatively maintaining flat. Um, so let's go ahead and, and switch over to some of the macro view stuff. Uh, we'll just take it from left to right, uh, top to bottom. This is the 10 year yield. So essentially I, uh, you know, the, the 10 year yield was in a bull market, really all, all of the government yields are in a bull market along with the dollar index. And um, essentially I had this yellow circle uh, for quite some time. Um, these lines up here, these white lines, uh, they are uh, lifetime moving averages. Um, maybe we can go on to a longer term view. So this is the monthly view. So this is basically like almost the entire history of, um, of the 10 year yield. And so you can see that, uh, you know, we're basically, you know, I, I put that yellow circle there uh, months ago, simply because it, it looked to me a lot like moving into these lifetime moving averages was probably um, a reasonable spot. And so um, normally, so bonds are, bonds are a very interesting thing because they have this weird um, double dynamic. So on the one hand, historically, it's been the case that when people leave the stock market, they go into the bond market. So when there's a lot of demand for bonds, that means the people selling them don't have to offer you an attractive interest rate, right? The interest rates can keep going down because people are saying, hey, you know, everyone wants a bond, right? And if you're the seller, you don't want to pay interest. You're, you want to pay as little interest as you can. So when interest rates go up, that means that there's not any demand for bonds. It means that money is usually moving from bonds to the stock market. But because of the way that all the leverage has happened in the economy over the past really decade, but especially during the COVID stuff, it ended up being the case that as bond yields were rising, it meant that people really didn't want bonds in that market as it started coming down. Actually, instead of having this effect where money was leaving the bond market and going into the stock market, it was also leaving the stock market because of the instability. And I think also because as higher as the rates go up, that makes the leverage harder to sustain. Um, you have to pay higher interest rates on that. So um, there's kind of like this dual dynamic that happens in the bond market. So anyways, the 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 quick and dirty part is that um, 
as these yields go up, that's kind of price negative for risk assets at the moment. Um, I don't think this is over. I think that we are probably going to come back into this area at some point, could be next year. But we are finally hitting those spots where, okay, maybe maybe this thing is getting close to being over. Maybe we can find some way to reverse. Um, the Dixie is basically the same story. This is the weekly uh, Dixie chart. Let's go to the monthly, actually. And you can see that these horizontal uh, dashed lines, these are, these are places of significance. These are horizontal areas of significance going all the way back to 2000 and the 70s. And if we go into some of the smaller time frames, maybe the daily, I basically drew this, um, you know, this parabola because usually um, once price gets going in a bull market, you'll see things like to go parabolic for a period of time. Now, the dollar has broken this parabola and it's taken a pretty significant pullback, but that doesn't mean that it's over. Right. We're, we're not quite done. And even if we go back to uh, like the 2000s, uh, right around the dot com era, um, you can see that. You know, price was was topping for quite some time, right? Came up, took a big pullback, came up again. So this could continue to play out for some period of time, even potentially all next year. But at any rate, um, with the Dixie coming down, that that has been a factor in why the stock market um, has been bullish. And maybe crypto would have followed, except for all of the um, all of the bankruptcies that happened. But at the same time, it's like I, I've heard people say to me, yeah, but you didn't know FTX was going to go was going to go bankrupt. And it's like, OK, I didn't know that specifically they were. But I did know that there was a lot of leverage. There was a lot of fraud um, still wrapped up in this ecosystem and that there was a lot of people that had barely narrowly uh, avoided getting liquidated and getting going bankrupt in the June crash. So it's kind of like not it's still, you know, just the intuition that oh, there's there's more to come. I don't know exactly who the next guy is going to be. When it comes to FTX, you have hundreds of companies that had counterparty risk and uh, were totally exposed. I mean, you just get on Twitter, get on Reddit, and you can just see name after name, some of them quite big. And uh, we're, we're starting to see more organizations, more bankruptcy happens, uh, or at least um, the move towards that. And so the problem is that we don't really know who the next shoe to fall is. Like we said last week, FTX started the capitulation, but it's not over. Um, we need to see a few more of these big companies go bust. We probably need to see price. Um, I really want to see price go down into my targets, and uh, and then we want to see we want to continue to see some of these uh, macro financials turn around. Yeah, man. What's, what's that, Doug? You're on it, man. <laughs> you you are on it. You're you're very good at this. What do you, what do you, you what do you think about DCG Group? Do you think they they could be uh, a part of the contagion? That would really surprise me. Although they're refusing to prove reserves over GBTC and the GBTC premium is like minus 40%. It's, you know, Bitcoin is at like $10,000 in terms of GBTC on the stock market. Um, they've been around since 2014. But here's an interesting thing. Barry Silbert was the founder and CEO. I think he left last year as the CEO. But this guy is also another little weft young superstar, uh, World Economic Forum superstar. Yeah, um, yeah. So Z, Z who knows? Still no, numero uno, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Glorious, uh, if, I, I mean, I hate to wish ill upon anybody, but I don't really like the guy. I met him uh, in person at uh, an event at Bloomberg. It was a crypto event back in the day. And anybody was able to go. It was awesome. And showed up and it was there were some really good talks and barry he was there and it was when i i really first heard somebody pitch bitcoin as digit as being digital gold and <sighs> i remember i raised my hand in the audience and i i like i was like kind of blown back i was like it's not about digital gold it's about digital cash da, 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 da. and uh <laughs> it, just, it was like it was it was great and then i even off stage i talked to him and he he just was not having it you know, he, he didn't he didn't like it, but it was like literally for me. That's and I think that really was the ad. It, I, he really was the purveyor of the, of that concept. Uh, I think it's so interesting how the narratives that won the day were all originated from people that have direct connections to like deep state type entities, Microsoft, Google, World right? Economic Forum, Bilderberg. Guys, right? why is this? This like, is so obvious to us. How are other people not picking up on this? You know? Hey, you know, it wasn't until a year or two ago that I finally picked up on it. I was part of all the narratives, especially a lot of the Bitcoin maximalism narratives. I always kind of I didn't like the religious overtones that were forming. So that gave me some suspicion. Um, but I, you know, I was uh, pitching a lot of those same narratives myself for quite some time. So hopefully yeah. we can reach some people and, and make them or convince them to reconsider some of those narratives. What do you, I mean, what do you think, man? Do you think they, they ultimately still win the war or are they going to get toppled? 
because that's really what it's what's coming down right it's like an information war which is ultimately yeah i think um i mean it's a long game right it's a long war and i see there's a lot of there's a lot of fundamental changes happening right now it seems to me like ethereum could very well be the pivot bitcoin has these negative price events on its horizon dominance keeps going down uh, you know we the, the big thing is stable coins right and so if we think about it like the power that these guys have originates from their ability to control the currency. Gold has already been a reserve asset for a very long time, and it hasn't stopped them from running their fiat schemes. So if you turn Bitcoin or crypto into digital gold and or just a gambler's game, then where's the digital freedom money? Where's the actual currency that we need to transact peer to peer from person to person without their middlemen in the way? The whole reason that um, you know they made gold a reserve asset and then started the, the fiat system was so that they could put their middlemen, banks, and credit card companies right, right in the way of um, free commerce. Um, so I think on. we win. Spot, spot on. Said so well. Go ahead. Sorry. Keep going. So I, I think ultimately, you know, it's just a long game. It's slow and steady wins the race. Uh, we're gonna, we're just gonna keep making advances. I see so many more people on Twitter, on Reddit, like the, and I see a lot more upvotes and shares on Twitter, uh, on Twitter Monero content now. So that's um, that's a really good sign, and I think that's just going to continue. So um, I just got a few more things to show you guys here. This is the reverse repos. Now, if you remember, I've been saying that uh, this represents latent economic energy. This is just um, cash that gets stored overnight with the Fed, and people get uh, like a small percentage in return for doing that. But this is liquid cash. Like these people can, the people that have this money can get this money back quickly, and it's sitting at two trillion dollars right now. And so what I've been saying is that like you can see our entrance into the bear market here as uh, the reverse repo started going up back in. 20, especially 2022, and but even you know all through 2021. So what I one thing that I want to see to be convinced that hey we're looking at the potential for you know a sustained bull market here is uh, we want to see these reverse repos continue to come down over time. So that's just one you know you only get this every I think it's every day they report this and it's um, this is a very big broad picture kind of metric. It's it's not something you can look at um, like on a daily basis for intraday kind of cues. Uh, and then the thing that I really wanted to show you guys today was the stock market. So again, I always like to start with the broad picture. This is the NASDAQ going all the way back to its inception in the 80s. And you can see we essentially have this big parallel channel. It's, um, it's a little bit more clear if you look at it on the weekly. I know it's, it's probably kind of hard to see this over, um, over YouTube. They don't, I, I've noticed the resolution on YouTube doesn't always leave something to be desired. But anyways, so, um, this is the dot com bubble. We, uh, I just, we, you know, I was just a kid during that time, but, you know, the NASDAQ got way ahead of itself, came back into this channel, overperformed to the downside, but then regained the channel for a very long time. And then we've got the COVID, all the COVID nonsense. Uh, we went from the top of the channel all the way down during the March 2020 crash back up and then formed this rising wedge. We broke down from that. So you could probably see, uh, let's see, that dashed, that dashed yellow line is uh, the pre-COVID highs, right? So this is right before everything crashed. And it's kind of been my position that I want us to get back down into this area. This is just such a natural place for support to happen. That's an easy buy. Um, that's at a minimum, it's an easy swing trade, but it could very well be the bottom. So we're making slightly lower lows all the way. Um, we've got kind of like a nice little rebound. So those inflation numbers that came in uh, 10 days ago, uh, that's that really gave the market uh, an impetus to go up. Um, we've seen the prices of oil is falling a little bit. So as the market's looking at inflation, they say, well, OK, energy is going to be a big component of that. If the price of oil is dropping, then that means people should be able to provide um, products at a little bit cheaper prices. But ultimately, the inflation numbers came down a little bit. So the market was giddy. They, they really want to pump. Um, but OK, the thing that I really wanted to show you today is um, is the Z is the Z scores. Um, so again, Z scores are like RSI. I have RSI here on the bottom, and maybe we'll look at the RSI as well in a second. But I do like Z scores better because they're statistically a more correct way of doing it. And the point is here is that we're looking at the formation of divergence, at least the potential for it. Um, so this is momentum divergence, where essentially we are making lower lows, but the momentum is making higher lows. And, uh, you know, I haven't looked at the RSI until just right now, but let's go ahead and take a look at it and see if it says the same thing. The answer is yes. So, again, we're forming this kind of long-term divergence. 
Now, to me, the dream scenario, the thing that I would love to see, I want to see this market pull back, drop down right into this area. And then we would see RSI pull down and make another higher low. And then from there, that's kind of like, I mean, that's that would be the last signal that I would want to see. I would get long crypto. I would get long, you know, the stock market, you know, my meager 401k. Uh, I would probably just YOLO that into some kind of um, maybe 3x NDX or 3x um, S&P 500. So, um, yeah, this is a this is actually a really good sign. This is the kind of stuff you want to see for being convinced that some kind of big turnaround is um, is happening, is about to happen. So still, though, there again, there could be another lower low, like the stock market could take another big tumble. Um, I think that would be the ideal scenario to give us the completion of this um, of this bullish RSI, bullish momentum divergence. Um, and again, you know, obviously, my view being that I would like to see Bitcoin make it down into my target, the uh, regression analysis target. And those are just easy buy points like we can just yellow your money back into the markets and um, probably sit sit pretty for at least a few months going into next year so yeah that's where i see the markets are at right now you know it's it's scary out there there's still more bankruptcies but you know there there really is big opportunities coming up here do we see monero hitting 0.02 btc by monerotopia let's see <laughs> i mean ultimately yes Can you make it happen we gotta take all right so there's 0.02 I guess is is that where is that where they bought? Is that your ratio buying point? Have you been hodling all this time? Um, I like that number. Okay, so I mean, yeah, you know, ultimately we could. There's there's a lot of places. There's a lot of places that we have to get ahead of first, right? So that's a spot. This right here is a spot. We're getting pretty close to it, right around the 0.09 area. This, right? These are all levels that are going to be important. Just horizontal areas of significance. It's a long road to get back there. Now maybe. Maybe it happens all at once. Maybe this Gox going getting dropped onto Kraken. Maybe even one percent of them decide that they're going to buy Monero with that, um, and that could be like that. That would be significant, especially in the face of Binance and all these other exchanges being almost totally out of Monero. If people get onto Kraken and then just clean out their order books, and it really doesn't take that much Bitcoin to do it, uh, we could we could really see a big price explosion uh, next year. I think people are really going to wake up to the idea of if you're going to use an exchange, you might as well withdraw via Monero, even if you ultimately want to get back into Bitcoin again. And I think once people do that, they'll be like, you know what? I'll just keep some keep some Monero. You know, people are really kind yeah. of more cognizant of the fact that their transactions are are getting traced. I think. One thing that's cool is that, um, you know, Monero has been on this whole fractional reserve thing for a very long time. And I'm seeing just the beginnings of people talking about, oh, fractional reserve, they don't actually have your Bitcoin, pull it off the exchanges. And, you know, in Monero over here, we've been sitting here for like a year and a half being like, listen, they are totally fractionally reserving our coin. So we're kind of ahead of that narrative. We're ahead of that story right now. We're like patient zero in that regard. Yeah, been there, done that. Yeah. So, you know, we've got we've got the whole sort of uh, social infrastructure very aware, like everyone in Monero, most people in Monero are very aware of this problem. And, uh, you know, so we've got the tweets, we've got the the posts going back for a long time now where it's like, hey, we've we've been warning about this. We've been trying to help people about this. So um, that can only be a good thing for us. Yeah, and we're more immune to it because we're just not on as many as exchanges. Right. And the exchange yeah. we're on, the major one we're on is Kraken, which. We, there appears to be some trust there. Hopefully, you know, they'll be pr providing, uh, you know, a way of verifying soon, right? You see, you see that happening soon? I don't know. I didn't hear anything from Kraken that they were intending to do that. I would like to see them release some view keys. There's some nuance there. So Monero has view keys. And um, that the problem is, from a cryptographic standpoint, you can only use those to tell incoming transactions, but you can't see outgoing transactions. However, apparently it's it's fairly trivial for someone that knows what they're doing to um, do some basic chain analysis to figure out when those funds were actually spent. Yeah, I mean, I, is, is anybody working on a proof of funds for Monero? Like a, you know, easy, like a way for exchanges to easily implement something like that if they wanted to beyond just, you know, Yuki's something that would actually prove funds. Oh, I mean, there's Seraphis, um, which is yeah. a more complete view key kind of thing. I haven't heard of anyone developing that, but uh, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. If anybody knows, maybe talk about it in, in the spaces. Maybe Justin knows. That awesome. would be so awesome if we could commence Kraken to do that. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't see why not. It's like you're calling them on their bullshit, right? If they're not willing to do it, especially if you know there was they're being assisted in development, like what would their reasoning be not to do it, right? 
Yeah. I mean, maybe they're like 70% reserved or 50% reserved, you know, enough so that they, they never have withdrawal problems, but they're not fully reserved. I mean, I would like to think that's not the case, but... Or some competitive exchange, right? Maybe, you know, there might be some new, you know, we see exchanges are dying, but we might see some new versions. So obviously we're going to see decentralized exchanges, but we might see some more pure purebreds like a Kraken or something, because that starts to become the competitive advantage, you know, an exchange that people can really trust and doing it in a way where people can validate on their own. So obviously decentralized. I'm holding exchanges. my breath. You no, know, but I, I don't know. I think there's a market for it now. Like, I mean, we're even saying, right? We're even saying that Kraken might gain mo momentum, right? Like more people might start using Kraken. Why is that? Because the people are desire this uh, ability to, to trust an exchange, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is an important function. We do need to be able to get between crypto and dirty fiat. Like it's just for now, it's, it's the reality. Yeah, the only way. Although, you know, there's a lot of people that would say use local Monero, use uh, Havado whenever it comes out. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. But practically speaking, you know, it's it's a good avenue from the fiat world. And, what, and what's like what's good about Monero is you can get in that way. And then once you move off the exchanges, you're, you know, nobody can see what you do thereafter. So it's it's not like doing with Bitcoin in my mind is really bad. But doing it with Monero, obviously, ideally, you're getting it directly with cash, but it's not nearly as bad as if you were to do it with Bitcoin. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Body man, thank you so much. What's your My new, pleasure. What's your new Twitter handle? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, for the Twitter spaces, you know, you guys uh, pulled, uh, pushed me to do it. And uh, I have <laughs> Monegro. <laughs> My Twitter name is Monegro. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna blow up on Twitter, man. Oh, yeah. I, ho I hope I'm not responsible for you getting a Twitter addiction now. Uh, I'll um, I'll, I don't know. I'll be careful. I'll, maybe I'll just replace it with a healthy drug addiction or something. Ah! But if you start freaking out sharks and stuff, yeah, people are gonna love it. Look at him already <laughs> telling you what to do. No, I'm telling him for his. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. He's got. He knows. But it's something that I've been wanting to do, been thinking about doing for a long time. I'm, you know, really honestly trying to. Um, so part of the problem is, as you mentioned, it's, it's easy to get addicted to social media. And when you're spending time engaging socially, you're not spending time writing scripts, doing analysis, uh, learning new skills, right? You're just kind of like chit chatting with people. And I, we definitely need that. Monero needs a lot of that because, I mean, I guess probably a lot of people in Monero, we are sort of tech oriented. We do like to go do nerd kind of projects and stuff. Um, so I've kind of been avoiding it for a long time because I just know that that I will end up spending a decent amount of time on social media. And Reddit has been nice because like it's kind of like being able to journal out in the open. Right. I'm just writing up my ideas, writing up my analysis, and it helps me organize my thoughts. And so it's easy for me just to post that on Reddit and, and share it with people. But, uh, you know, Twitter is more like, all right, let's uh, let's do this. Let's convince some people. Let's get popular. You know, let's uh, <laughs> let's put out cool content that people want. And, uh, you know, that's a that's a dangerous game in a lot of ways. Agreed. Agreed, man. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'd rather have you doing the, the technical stuff. I don't want to you wasting your brain power on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a time. It is a horrible time sink. It really is. That's why we kind of suck at the social media parts because we just don't like it. Yeah, I don't yeah. like it. You like I, I understand it the importance of it, but it's like it, it wastes your time. Waste your time. It's not. It doesn't, it doesn't feel all that productive. Well, the thing is, it's a necessary function. Like, there's you guys are one of the few people in Monero that are really like doing the Lord's work out there and um, doing the outreach. And sure, there's. I don't want to like minimize anyone else's contribution, but you guys are really doing a lot of stuff to um, to put Monero out into the social um, atmosphere. And it's something that needs to be done, right? And it seems like, for whatever reason, the narrow people are less inclined to do that. So, um, yeah, your work well, is very much appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. One hundred percent. Nobody, nobody wants to be public. I get it. It's and like, yeah, yeah. why would you want to uh, destroy your own privacy as you try to, you know, achieve perfect privacy? <laughs> yeah, it's it's it like a sense. sacrifice. So we'll do it for you guys. <laughs> yeah, somebody's got to take one Someone's for the team. Someone's got to do it, and we're okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate the love yeah. and support. So yeah. yeah, thank you for the kind words. That's, that really means a lot to us. Yeah, somebody was, somebody was saying, uh, Monero Maxi, you guys are living like the the ideal crypto life. <laughs> yeah, man. We uh, we love it. We yes, love yes, it. Yes, yes, Ghost is asking us to add olive oil to gratuitous. Oh, yes. There you go. Huh. I'm sure we're, we're working on many things. It's just, you know, there's 
so we much tried, time we in the day, guys. We had a guy guys. in Greece, remember, like two years ago, and then it just never it yeah. came together. Well, it's time, really. We could just, hit him up again. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're getting better at adding products to Gratuitous, so. We're becoming That's a pretty cool. Faster. Body man, thank uh, you thank much. You so much. And yeah, for those listening in the spaces and, you know, in the podcast, you know, you can always check out the charts if you're interested on YouTube and Odyssey after the live stream. So just in case everyone, anyone yeah, is or, curious. Yeah, or you can check them out now during the show. Well, yeah, but obviously it just finished. So I'm telling you, <laughs> <laughs> for those that just jumped into the space and just missed it, True. you can always catch it um, after the live stream on uh, YouTube Pe or Odyssey. People live, uh, listening on spaces, can you uh, like tweet this out? Share it. Let's try to grow the spaces. Share the love. Let's try to get Kim.com on. Like, can yeah. somebody uh, retweet his tweet? What did he say? Looking into Monero. Yeah, again? looking into Monero. Yeah. Well, somebody, I think uh, that'd mean a lot of if somebody could tweet that out right now and everybody can go like it and we could say, like, come into the Monero spaces room. Let's see if we get his attention. He's been doing a lot of spaces recently. He's got like, a, I think, like a million followers or something. Oh, so that'd be great if you pull them in. That would be pretty nice. Forward. Pretty nice, but this is yeah. what we got to do, body. This is what we got to do. <laughs> and thank you for yep. your work, and thank you for uh, doing the price report. Really appreciate it. People love it. Thank you. Yeah, oh, thanks for sharing it. As Put, usual, putting up with us last night, you know, trying to figure out the whole space. The spaces thing. there. <laughs> appreciate that. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, please. no problem at all. All right. Thank you. You go uh, enjoy right, the buddy. rest of your weekend and your day. Jump in spaces. Right, thanks, guys. Jump in the spaces if okay. you can. At the time. All, all right. right. Thank you so okay, much. Bye. Thank you. Hasta luego. Bye.